Shemaya didn't come home. And I knew something is wrong. As the time went on, I started to have dreams. It felt so real. In the dream, she was telling me she was being held against her will. And I'm like, where are you, where are you? She was like, I don't know. I'm in this room. It just has one window, but I don't see nothing. She was crying and she's like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. It's Rockville, spelled out in rocks. I like it. Super pretty. They take a lot of pride in this being a historic district. I mean, there's signs on every lamppost. Rockville was an old mill town. A lot of, lot of silk mills, a lot of woolen mills. You have mills here, and they were a booming industry. And then on top of the hill, that's where the owners would build their mansions, where they could sit back and survey the empire that they built. It doesn't look real. It looks like a movie set, like something that you would see at Disney World. It was first or second richest town in the United States at one time. Down below, you have the workers' housing. You can see here, these are little, you know, salt box kit houses that would have been really easy to put up quickly back when this community really had a lot of industry. Rockville really was the hub here. But as time progressed, certain parts of, of Rockville have fallen on hard times. Rockville became the center of a lot of problems too. Drug dealing and shootings and serious crime. As the town began to change, less traditional businesses made their way in. In 2007, this was a strip club called Cahoots, which was a really big draw to this community. It was a big party spot. And so people in town had pretty strong opinions about whether it was great and super fun, or it was an element of the city that was creeping into a town that had fallen on hard times. There was a young woman named Shemaya Smith who was in her early 20s who would commute from East Hartford all the way out here to dance because it was a lucrative opportunity for her. One day, she leaves for work, but she never makes it home. What could have happened? Is she deciding she doesn't want to be a part of this business anymore? Is she kidnapped? Or is it something worse than that? And for her family, the not knowing was excruciating. My name is Monique Frank. I'm the sister of Shemaya Smith. I have four siblings. I'm the oldest out of everyone. Shemaya was the youngest. She always had a smile on her face. Somewhat naive, no one did any wrong in her eyes. Just because of the difference in age, I felt like Shemaya was my daughter. That was my baby. My kids, they love Auntie Maya. That's what they call her. They just always wanted to be with her because she was just so fun. Take them to the park. Let's go ride bikes. Let's go live on edge a little bit because your mom not gonna let you do this, so, so, you know. Well, I lived in my own apartment. Shemaya lived with my mom and her dad. She wanted to go back to school to do cosmetology. But in 2007, she was dancing as a, a exotic dancer. I didn't approve of some of the things that she would do, so she would kind of like hide it from me. I got the phone call from my mom saying that she might not answer her phone. I'm like, that's not like her. They said she went to work and didn't come home. And I started to call her phone. 
on my way to my mom's house, but she never picked up the phone. No one is getting a response. We're reaching out to friends, um, places where we think that she would be, but no one's seen her. So I called the police. They did tell me because she was an adult, we had to wait 48 hours before they can actually take any action. It was a long 48 hours, but we waited. And then the next day, I called them back and we did the missing persons report. It was basically a waiting game after that. I think missing person cases in all police department deserve a great deal of attention. But most police departments don't pursue them vigorously enough. I was a police officer in the town of East Hartford for 30 years. Much of that time was spent as a detective, detective sergeant, and then finally a lieutenant in charge of detectives. I always had my hand in all the cases. After the weekend, my routine was to read every report that flowed through the department. That Monday, I found a particular case, a missing person for Shemaya Smith, 22 years old, who went missing on the 14th of March. So I go, why am I learning of this now? It's cold, it's getting cold. Candidly, I was upset that I hadn't been contacted about this case over the weekend. And when I went to the patrol supervisor, my counterpart, he said the case was just a random missing person case and the person would turn up and why would I think that there was anything more to it? But I knew right away it required immediate attention. I needed to find my sister. So I put my kids in the car, we drove to Channel 3 News and I went and gave them a picture because I wanted, if someone else seen her that don't know her, maybe they could have said, hey, we seen her here, we seen her there. But they was like, you know, we can't, we can't just air it out like that if, if there's no police report. And I'm like, there is a police report. But I guess the police didn't say anything as of yet. It was very frustrating. I felt, oh, because she's an exotic dancer, she's black, she doesn't matter. They cover what they want to cover. The number of black women who go missing in our country is disproportionately higher than the number of white women who go missing. And yet their cases are less likely to be solved. But in Shamaya's case, the lead investigator really did take this case seriously. Hi, Hello. Lieutenant Stolt. Thank you for meeting with me. Glad to meet you. This is the missing persons report. So the report was filed two days after she went missing. Yes. So I immediately took over the case as a serious crime. I don't recall exactly what raised my red flags, but I was very certain that we needed to get to it rapidly, that we didn't have any time to waste. If a person is missing, the chances are there's going to be a criminal aspect to it. Were they running from somebody? Were they being victimized? There's so many possibilities. Yeah. When we got this case, it was almost six days later. In 2007, I was an investigator. I was very new. Lieutenant Stolt kind of showed me the ropes, if you will. First place we're going to look at is the home, anyone that has contact with that person. So Shamaya lived at home with her mother, Gloria, her father, Barry, and her boyfriend, Jamel. Everyone was a suspect at the time. They interviewed me. They interviewed my mom. They interviewed her dad. They interviewed my brothers. They asked a lot of questions about the boyfriend, how long they were together, how was the relationship, was he here when she left? Tell me about the boyfriend. When we went to the family home, Jamel was upstairs in the bedroom, and he didn't come down to talk to the police or add his contribution to how he could help us. He wasn't concerned? His behaviors of not showing interest in finding her would suggest he's involved. So that's a massive red flag. Yes. 
Shamaya goes missing. And the boyfriend, Jamel, is not communicating. Was her family alarmed by his behavior? Yes, they did feel it was odd, and they pointed the finger towards him that he was involved. He's living in their home, and they are suspicious of him. The police are suspicious of him. Well, he doesn't stay there much longer. He disappears. Uh, he leaves the home. And is gone. Yes. We were notified by the family that Jamel packed up everything and he left. We were clearly concerned, and it's very suspicious, obviously. We did track him down and finally had the opportunity to interview him. He said she was supposed to be picked up and brought to work. And so at 3 o'clock, she walked down the street, and Jamel never saw who was picking her up. So he's the last person that saw her? Yes. Is there anyone who can confirm Jamel's story that she was picked up for work that afternoon? Yes. Do you mind if I refer to this Absolutely. map? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, please. She didn't have a car, and she didn't have a driver's license, so she was dependent on people to give her rides to and from work. She lived in East Hartford, and this is the location of the Cahoots in Rockville. Okay. There was a coworker of Shemaya's who was apparently a very close friend, and she said Shemaya was getting rides from a person known as Silver Dollar. Had you ever heard that name before? No, it's a whole new person. One of the strippers at the club had told the family that Shemaya told her that Silver Dollar was going to give her a ride to work. So her friend said she got a ride from the Silver Dollar guy. Were you able to track him down? We were able to identify Silver Dollar and take a statement from him. So Silver Dollar said, yes, I came to East Hartford and I picked her up on the 14th. That day? That day that she went missing. And I took her to Cahoots. So now he becomes the last person to actually be with her. The officers came out here to verify that, and we looked at hours upon hours upon hours of video captured from their security cameras. And we witnessed a lot of illicit activity, mm -hmm. but we could not find any video of her coming into cahoots in that time frame. So, so. his story falls apart because the video evidence shows that she never arrived at work. Yes first impulse would be that he's lying and he took her somewhere else. But it's almost too easy. What do you mean? Because it was a red herring. We looked on the day prior to being missing, and we did find that she had been dropped off at work 24 hours earlier by Silver Dollar. His dates were off. He ended up actually giving her a ride the night before so prior to when she went missing. So now you've had Silver Dollar fall apart as a suspect. There's nothing concrete tying the boyfriend to her disappearance. What is the next piece of the puzzle for you guys decide to pursue? Her own phone records, but you needed to get a search warrant. And getting a search warrant in this case was very difficult because there were many people who didn't believe that she was a victim of a crime. There were many people who believed that there was no need for urgency. So the administration and other agencies pushed back. It's a missing girl. That's got to be really tough because you're the person that's been in the room with the family. They didn't have any leads. They didn't know where to look. So I got wary. Basically took it into my own hands and stayed in the room and trying to, you know, break into her voicemail. I was just playing with different numbers on the house phone. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I was just playing one, two, three, four, three, four, five, six. I wasn't going to let it go. I needed to find my sister. If it had been a 22-year-old white girl, would there have been more urgency? Not on my part, but yes, it would, it would have been treated differently, absolutely. Thank God the family, they were pretty pushy about finding out what happened to Shemaya themselves. I spent two days trying to break into the code for her voicemail until I got into her voicemail. And there was this one message that stood out to me. And it was actually the day she went missing. 
The person on the phone said, just wanted to know if you want to hook up. The family was able to access Shemaya's voicemail, and there was a message on there from a guy named Ken. So we ran a check on the phone number, and it came back to Ken Otto. What do you learn about him immediately just from his phone number? We learned that he lives in Ellington, Connecticut, next to Rockville, a nice, quiet neighborhood full of larger, expensive houses. He's a true businessman. He built a company himself, and there were satellite offices. So he's well-to-do. He's married, has children. He's not the person that you think might hang out at strip clubs and calling exotic dancers on his phone. So because of who he was in this small town, when his name comes up on your radar, is there any pushback within the department about investigating him? It did create a whole different attitude and treatment. Now, for some reason, we have to be very careful. We have to make sure we're not offending anyone or ruffling feathers. You felt like you had to investigate quietly so as to not embarrass anybody. Uh, I didn't see it the same way at all. This is urgent. I had concern that she was maybe being held somewhere, that we might be able to locate her and bring her to safety. Mm -hmm. So we need to go find Ken Otto and talk to him and see what he can offer us regarding Shemaya. We decided we were going to take a ride up to Ellington and go see if we can talk to Mr. Otto. So we drive up to the house and Mr. Otto opens the door. His hair is kind of disheveled. He said that he had been in bed for a few days and he was feeling sick. And we explained that we wanted to talk to him in regard to a missing person case. He certainly didn't want us to park our vehicle in front of his house. He didn't want us going into his home. But he agreed to meet at the police department. What does Ken Otto tell you about his relationship with Shemaya? Ken told the investigators that he was a person who wanted to help other people. And he went to cahoots because there were women who needed his intervention, you know, a nice girl like you doing in a place like this mm. kind of thing. He said that he knew Shemaya and she was a nice girl and that they were building their relationship. March 9th, a week prior to her disappearance, I received a call from Shemaya asking me to meet her. She pulled up in a cab and I asked her, why are you getting out of the cab? Where are you coming from? And she said, oh, one of my friends dropped me off at a 7-Eleven somewhere. And I'm like, why wouldn't a person bring you all the way home? That just didn't sound right to me. She said she was coming from a friend's house and the person gave her money, $500 or whatever. And I'm like, what did you have to do for the $500? I didn't have to do nothing. She got very defensive. Mr. Otto did admit that about a week before she went missing on the 9th, that they drove to Esnanta College in Enfield. And she mentioned to him that she wanted to get a degree in cosmetology. He did mention that he gave her money, that she was also looking to try to purchase a car to be more independent. The pieces line up that this is the game. This is, you know, I'll put you through school. You'll do what I need from you. But he presented it that this was non-sexual, that he cared about her and he was offering what he could as a successful businessman living in Ellington. Mm -hmm. And that this is what it was all about. In the meeting with your investigators, does he admit that he saw her on March 14th? Yes, he does. He said that he ended up driving her to Coots to go to work. He told us that he wasn't feeling well and he, was, he had been sick. So he dropped Shemaya off at the Cahoots near the front door and he went home to Ellington and he was in bed for three days. Well, at this point, you'd already checked all the security footage of the Cahoots. So did it make you doubt your initial look at that footage? You want to be cold and professional and always double check. And so we did. And we rechecked and looked at the volumes of video they had. We could not find 
Canaro's truck mm -hmm. arriving at Cahoots and couldn't find Shemaya coming through the door. We can't corroborate his story of dropping off at Cahoots, but what we do know is that Canaro is now the last person who admittedly is with her. We realized Ken Otto is hiding things, so now we have to find what he's hiding. So investigator Olson and I are arranged to meet Ken Otto and take him for a ride so he could walk us through step by step everywhere he went with Shemaya. This is Ellington, Connecticut, a thriving farming community. Ellington has the space and clearly a lot of affluence. This is the main street. It's a church, the historic society, and a strip of shops that looks like a hitching post from old timey days. It's got that safe Americana vibe to it. Crime doesn't typically happen in Ellington. It's kind of a rural community of faith-based people. Ellington was just where you lived, but the action was in Rockville, no question. It was all about Rockville. It's not lost on me that the thing to do over in Rockville back in 2007 was go to the strip club, and over here in Ellington, they proudly display the classic car shows and the ice cream social. It is a really big difference between the two communities. During the initial interview with Mr. Otto, although he was forthcoming with information, we determined that there were some things that he told us that weren't completely accurate. So Don Olson and I picked Ken Otto up and began the process retracing the steps that he claimed happened. It's important to be specific. So instead of going directly to Cahoots, uh -huh. it turns out the story is now unraveling that they traveled into Route 5. And it was clear the details of his movements. They were evolving. We continued northbound into Enfield. And Enfield is where the Asnunta Community College is. Ultimately, he claimed that they went around the side of the building and parked and that Shemaya then uh, tried to perform sexual activities with him. That's a major piece of information that he admits, OK, I did have sexual relations with her. Now, he was starting to get antsy, and he did offer what I would call a bribe or an attempt to bribe. He basically said something to the effect of, well, what do I need to do to make this go away. And we we're kind of looking at each other like, I don't, I think he's trying to bribe us. You know, like he was looking to see if we would say, you know, well, hey, you have to give us $10,000. We'll just forget this ever happened. Is he just embarrassed? You know, a man of his stature being caught having an affair with a much younger woman who he met in a strip club? Or, is he now trying to use his means and his influence to get out from underneath an investigation into her disappearance? Guys have affairs, women have affairs. It happens in life. But there was nothing illegal about that. Whether his wife was happy with it or not, I don't know. We'll leave to others. Been practicing law in Connecticut for approximately 50 years. And Mr. Otto was a family man. He'd been married for 33 years. He had no criminal record. He's not the type of person that you would think would go out and commit this type of horrific crime. Ellington is a close-knit community, and he was well-respected in his own neighborhood. These are people that saw him every day. But I don't think it was common knowledge. This gentleman of, uh, I believe, 54 years of age was having a relationship of any sort with this young woman of 22 years of age. As the days went by, my brothers and my mom still had hope, but this was around the time where they had a lot of trafficking. So I had this weird dream. She was being trafficked. And there was this one window 
that she was looking out of. I kept saying, tell me what you see, tell me what you see. And she kept saying, I can't see nothing. And I'm like, do you know where you're at? How long was the drive? She just kept saying, I have to keep having sex with all these guys. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. I thought that that was a sign. We don't know where she is. But you didn't have any real evidence against Ken Otto, right? Right, but I had done a little research and found out that Ken Otto mm -hmm. had a daughter-in-law. And so I contacted her. She was very emotional and upset. She spoke about Ken Otto's behavior, particularly towards women, inappropriate, dismissive, and abusive. So clearly she was afraid of something. She was anxious to hang up, mm -hmm. but she offered some information. Ken Otto owned a large tract of property, 75 acres. 75 acres is a big chunk of property. Yes, it is. It's a remote area, landlocked, surrounded by other private property and a state forest. Uh -huh. And that property was never brought up by him. So that was telling that he was hiding something from us. This is now something that we needed to get resources out there as quickly as possible. How do you even lay eyes on it if it's landlocked like that? I had called the Eastern District Major Crimes on several occasions trying to get their involvement in the case because it was in their jurisdiction, but they didn't think there was a case. That must uh, have been incredibly frustrating. It was, it was very frustrating. But I did get the cooperation of the aviation unit. I was able to get the state police helicopter up with Detective Olson. And they flew right out, out to the property. And then my wife, who's a detective, and her partner, they went out on the ground. It had snowed a few days before. And we could see that there were tire marks leading into the property from the main road. So we could see there was recent activity. And then there was a shed, and there was a large camper. At that point, my biggest concern was Shamaya could be held against her will on that property. But you don't have a warrant to search it. No, but when you have reason to believe someone's life is maybe hanging by a thread, you have exigent circumstances. Exigent circumstances means? Emergency. So. I made the decision and directed the officers on the ground get into that property right away and try to find her. OK, sir, we're going in. My partner and I, are, we're in the helicopter, and we're flying over this property. And we have a couple of detectives down on the ground. I directed that the ground officers go onto the property and check those buildings out and look to see if we could find Shemaya. The detectives on foot, they went through the camper. Uh, they checked the sheds, did a quick you know, walk around the property, didn't see anything. They called back and said, there's no sign of her here. Wow. How much hope did you have that she would be in that trailer? It's a heartbreaker. I'm going to meet with Monique, who is Shemaya's older sister. And unless you have been through what their family has endured, it's impossible to imagine. She's a beautiful girl. Thank you. Hey, man, hands on hips. <laughs> She's an assertive girl. Them poses. Yeah. Had Maya disappeared before? Was that something that she'd ever done? No, that's not nothing she's ever done before. I was freaking out because I'm like, something's not right. My sister is somewhere being held against her will. Yeah. It's just, it's a lot of weird people out there. Whoever has her has her ID that has her address on it, her house key. Did that make you feel unsafe that someone could just easily get your family's personal information? I was worried about that. Did the police provide other information? They told us that they went to go have a conversation with someone that's a prime suspect, the last person to have seen her. They just said they have some leads. Back in 07, biggest thing at that point was phone records, phone tower, location information. We found out that on the 9th, about a week before 
Oh, she went missing. Shemaya's phone hit a phone tower across the street from Otto's property. So his story about them going to Azananta College was inaccurate. And then on the 14th, the day of her going missing, Mr. Otto's phone hit in the tower across the street from his property. So that showed that he wasn't home in Ellington, sick. He was actually on the property that night. We're just about three and a half weeks in. We have quite a bit of information, and Mr. Otto is our prime suspect. We just didn't have enough to get a search warrant for the property at that point. Kurt and I both agreed that consent search was obviously going to be the way to go. Based upon phone records, they decided that they wanted to search his property up there in Stafford. My client's public position was that he had done nothing wrong. He had nothing to hide, and he fully cooperated with the police. Mr. Otto agrees to the consent search on Easter Sunday. I contacted the state police, and I asked them if they were willing to supply troopers with cadaver-sniffing dogs to go out to the property. So then Don Olson and I, we picked up Ken and continued to the property. We didn't let on that we'd already gotten familiar with the property. He's very cocky and very confident. I was certain he thought he was smarter than the police, and he was certain that he would control the situation completely. This is the roadway to get into the property. You know, it's a dirt road. It goes into the woods in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, it's been a while. I had a very bad feeling. Ken Otto pointed out that he liked shooting animals on his property. Woodchucks, skunks, just killing things and leaving them out to decompose. The property suggested that this is a place of terror. I told you at the time, I said, Don, I don't do this, but today I'm carrying a backup weapon, and uh, we need to be on our toes with this guy because I have a bad feeling about what he might try to do to us. Right. So we started kind of looking around a little bit and asking him some questions, and he didn't appear nervous at all. As we were talking, state troopers showed up with the cadaver sniffing dogs, and that is the point where Ken showed alarm in his face. That's when he really knew that he was dealing with more than just a couple of cops from the East Hartford Police Department. He had to know it was much larger than that, and it, That's right. and it was, certainly. Yeah. As soon as Mr. Otto saw the dogs, I just saw all the color come out of his face. He went pale and started to look very, very nervous. He never saw that coming. He said, you guys, this isn't fair. You tricked me. I said to him, you can revoke your consent at any time. The dogs started to go around the property, and there was a clearing. And in the clearing, there was a, a very large fire pit. The dogs are hitting on the fire pit, and they're also hitting on the piles of dirt around the clearing. Dogs can't indicate whether it's a human or a fox or, or a rabbit. but they indicated there were a lot of spots where things had been killed. Mr. Otto was on his phone, and he didn't look very good. He was shaking, and he said, uh, all right, that's it. I want you guys off my property. One of the things that is so valuable about small towns and rural areas is that you live with space. There's a lot of freedom in that. The flip side of that is that there's also a lot of space to hide things. Ken Otto's property, it was what I characterized as hell. Someone's little personal hell that they created, where they didn't answer to anybody and they didn't care about anything. But the fact that the dogs sensed that there was a lot of death here, we now have the ingredients to get that search warrant. But I was very anxious 
that he might do everything he can to cover his tracks. Did you know that this search was going to take place? I do remember them saying that they had to get a warrant. And then we had this big rainstorm. It rained for like five days. The day we executed the search warrant, it was raining. It was cold, nasty, rainy, windy. We got out there to the property and found Ken Otto there. He had taken the backhoe and smashed his trailer home. And he tried to bury it in the ground. So we caused him to cease and desist, and then conducted our search warrant. When we got to the fire pit, now there had been more extensive burning. And they found some, what appeared to be the ball portion of, of a foot. I received a phone call saying that I needed to come home from work because the detectives was meeting with the family at the house. The detectives came in. Um, we're sorry. Shamai is not coming home. She's deceased. And everybody just broke down. And I was like, I want to see my sister. And he was like, you don't want to remember your sister like that. That broke us, the way they found her. We didn't have a body. We didn't have anything. We just had pieces. They said she was burned for days. For days. We had been following Mr. Otto 24-7. The day of the arrest warrant, I'm sitting in the judge's chambers, watching the judge read the report, and I have my partner talking to me in my ear with the team that's following Mr. Otto. They were giving us updates as the judge is sitting there reading this lengthy warrant. He's driving random places, doing quick turns, running lights, all these things that are designed to Fared out, the police are following him. They're telling us he's heading towards the airport. He's pulling into Bradley Airport. At that point, I directed the officer to take him into custody. Kenneth Otto Sr. may not walk the streets anytime soon. Otto was arrested at Bradley Airport with cash, pills, and a newly purchased passport. He's picked up at the airport with his passport and a large sum of money, but he's also found with rubber gloves, condoms, erectile dysfunction medication, a business card for an escort service. And then investigators find some other items in his bag, which seem even more suspicious. We found a small black satchel. Inside what we found, three or four necklaces, a pair of earrings. All of the jewelry in there was old, like beat up, maybe some sort of souvenir, as if this wasn't the first time that he's done something like this. That was something that we considered at that point. I don't think he was a newbie at this. I personally think he'd actually gotten away with other serious crimes in his lifetime. Dozens of people related to exotic dancer Shamaya Smith caught a glimpse of the man accused of her murder. Man, he shouldn't be able to get out nothing. I don't care what it is. He shouldn't be able to walk the street. I went up to the family home, and one of Shemaya's brothers, a young man, probably 14, 15 years old, who typically had kind of expressed distrust and, and anger towards the police, I remember that the brother hugged me. He just told us, thank you for doing this. Thank you for arresting the man that killed my sister. It was a tearjerker, and, but it was, the good feeling I got is, is, you know, we did right by this family. Relatives admit this is a tough time. They keep Shamaya close by wearing T-shirts with her photo on it. How quickly do you go from searching for her to fighting for justice? The same day. I mean, now the news was there. 
Uh, Mr. Otto is going to be going to court pleading not guilty and asking for a jury trial on this. He denies that he was involved with the uh, homicide of this young lady. He felt he would be acquitted merely because they find a body on the property. His claim is he wasn't the only person that had access uh, to that property. And uh, so whatever happened, it wasn't him. To see him coming in that courtroom and he had a smirk on his face as if I'm this big shot, I got all this money. And then he got these big shot lawyers. You know, you thinking he's going to get away with it. What was the difference in the way the media covered your sister's disappearance versus the way they covered the trial? Her disappearance was basically one clip for maybe two days. That's it. Then, once you get into, oh, exotic dancer, cahoots, murdered, slain. Shemaya Smith was reported missing more than a month ago when the East Hartford woman failed to show up for her job at Cahoots in Vernon, a strip club where the 22-year-old worked as an exotic dancer. It was a lot of attention after that, rather than if we could have got to her sooner, maybe she would have been alive, you know? I'm pretty sure he's done this before. Maybe it is some people out there that don't have family to fend for them or look for them or they don't know how. And in this case, I feel like he probably thought that Shemaya didn't have any family that cared. That's why he got caught, because we did care. To see the town and farms. It's the postcard of an America that we've all heard about. That seems impossible to think anything bad could happen down there. Because it's too pretty, right? But that's not the reality for a large portion of America. And in Shemaya's case, it was somebody from one of the brightest, shiniest households that did this to her. Predators know they can target people in marginalized communities, and their cases will not be investigated and pursued as vigorously. The only way to change that is if we collectively say, no more. The solving of their cases is important to us. That's how we let predators know you don't get to work in the dark anymore. We're watching. <laughs>